So well, welcome everybody to our, our nail binding talk and we're recording our session. So hopefully you're, you're cool with that. Um, you're welcome to mute yourself and send messages by text if you prefer not to be recorded, but otherwise we'll go for it. Uh, so my name is Edward the Red. I've been an SCA member for a long time, just about 30 years. Uh, I've been doing nail binding for about 15 years. And in my case, uh, my family was uh, headed out to a Viking Age demo in February in Canada, where it was cold. And I kind of needed to find a way to make authentic hats and mittens fast. So I picked this up and you can see some of my first attempts here and some stuff I've made later as well. So if we wanted to go through some of the rest of our attendees and if you could just introduce yourself, maybe say where you're from and uh, if you have any experience with nail binding or if you're brand new, uh, let us know. Skya, do you wanna start us off and yeah. then we'll, we'll roll through people? So I'm Skya, um, it's a Gaelic name. Just forget the rest of it, the end of it. <laughs> then is not there. Um, I've been trying to learn nail binding for about seven years now. <laughs> And uh, I usually meet, find somebody who knows how to do it. I get the knack of it. And then I practice and it just sort of disappears from my mind. I've made several nail binding needles. I clearly want to be able to do it. <laughs> so I, uh, I'm really looking forward to this. Oh, I'm in the Barony of Rising Waters, southernmost barony of the Kingdom of Eldamere. Laurie, would you like to go next? I've been with the SCA uh, officially for a year, though I've been to the, uh, the November feast twice already. And friends of ours uh, are in it and uh, they got us going. So I'm uh, interested in the nail binding. I've, I took up knitting a couple of years ago, so it's nice to learn something a little different and uh, we'll just see what happens. I'm in the Ottawa area. Lydia, would you like to go next? Sure. Um, my name's uh, Maestro Lydia de Ragusa, or Lydia. Um, I'm visiting you from Atlantia in the Charlotte, North Carolina region. Um, I have a dependent who is a very good null binder and unfortunately is working as a pharmacy tech this evening in her real life. And um, I have, I can make a row of Oslo stitch and I can make a beautiful little beginning circle for a hat. And then when I get to the second row, I kind of freak out. Uh, so um, I am interested in actually, it's time for me to know how to null, null bind. Some of my colleagues are, are quite good at it. They have the muscle memory and I'd like to get to that point. I do knit, so I certainly am I'm primarily a knitter, spinner, weaver. Um, so it's it it's just it to me it's just an essential skill as a you know skadian as somebody who's been in the society for over 20 years so i'm pathetic for not knowing yet but here we are together <laughs> uh emily would you like to go next amelia um <laughs> someday <laughs> someday i will remember I'll just bring this closer because I have crappy laptop mic. Um, I have yet to learn how to null bind because no one in my particular group does it. Um, although a couple years ago, I won supplies for it at some event or another. Um, obviously, I prefer late periods, so it's less urgent for me. Um, that's all. I, I mean, it's not unlike um, surface embroidery. So the detached buttonhole is similar, I think, to the Oslo stitch. So I, uh, I'm excited to learn. Thank you. Janine? Sky, uh, just a question. Do you have a spotlight turned on or we got them on people so that when they talk, they'll pick oh, them up? Oh, I will. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay, that'll Janine make it easier to, uh, to see everybody. I, I don't have video. Okay. Uh, just a uh, little quirk of mine but I do have audio hello and I'm sorry I was late joining what was the question oh we're doing introductions right now oh excellent okay yeah hi um Janine uh in the society I'm known as Morgan DeMarc I live in Artemisia Barony of Arnhold I stumbled across null binding about four years ago 
And it took me a couple of years to actually figure it out on my own because I learned down at Estrella and then there wasn't anybody else. And um, I found a couple of videos, uh, a couple of websites that are just brilliant and help me. And I've done really, really well. I'm really pleased with my progress. So I want to see what else is out there. All right, Lucy, would you like to go next? Hello, I am um, also from Atlantia and very happy to be joining you guys. I'm from the uh, DC region. This is my, my kitty. Um, and uh, I, I can relate because I have learned null binding several times and somehow not been able to actually then do it. Um, and uh, hope springs eternal that someday it'll finally, <laughs> finally, finally <laughs> stick. Um, just keep trying, right? Uh, but if you guys don't mind, I'm gonna um, turn my camera back off because I just got off work and I'm also scarfing down some dinner and I don't wanna subject you guys to that. So, but thank Absolutely. you so much for, uh, for inviting all of us uh, from Atlantia to join you. Uh, this is really terrific. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Luna, would you like to go next? Hi, I'm Luna. I am in Tor Brandt in Eldermere. Um, so this is amazing because I live far enough out. I can't, I haven't really played in a couple of years because I just can't get there. Um, I'm a knitter. I crochet too. I like trying new crafts. I've watched a few null binding videos, but failed miserably. Um, the fact that I tried it with a darning needle may have had something to do with that. I don't know eno enough to know yet. So this is going to be fun. Excellent. Laura, would you like to go next? Hi, I uh, actually am very, very new to the SCA, so I don't even know exactly where I am. I'm in Ottawa and part of Eldermere, but I don't know what our area is. I do not have a camera. I'm also technologically inept. That's why I'm late. Um, I have never heard of nail binding, but I love fiber arts. I do know how to knit. I hope to learn to crochet. So this is all very new to me, and I want to learn everything that I possibly can. Wonderful. Did I miss anyone? I think we're clear. I think we've had introductions got it, from everyone. Got it covered. That sounds good. Uh, if we get more people that join as we go, they can uh, pick it up as we go. So uh, once more, I'm Edward, I'll be your host tonight. And we're gonna talk a little bit about nail binding. So uh, I, I picked this up about 15 years ago uh, to outfit my, my family with hats and mittens. Uh, we are a, a Norman, a Saxon and a Viking respectively. And my son who was not very old at the time is now 21, so it's been a little while. Uh, so this is often called single needle knitting and the ne needles we work with are often quite blunt. They have a, a large enough hole to get some wool through them. Uh, the, my favorite needle here is bone, but let me take you on a tour of some other bits and pieces here. So I'm gonna pick up, can you spotlight my mobile camera, yep. please, Kaya? Right to it. And I will start the video on that one. So if you can see that one, we're gonna wander over to a table here. So we're gonna talk a little bit about some uh, different things you could make. So over here, I have some hats. So this was one of my first attempts that used to fit my son. He, he could wear it on his hand now, but probably not on his head. Uh, so this is out of a fairly coarse wool and a very basic stitch. And we'll probably cover some of this basic stitch today. Uh, below it is a hat I did for myself. Somebody m mentioned Oslo stitch. And if we, uh, if we have time, we'll talk about some different stitches. So this is one I've worn for a number of years and a new shiny hat uh, out of some uh, merino wool that my wife bought for me for Christmas. Uh, we have some mittens in a variety of different stitches, from, ranging from, again, a fairly chunky wool with a very basic stitch, and this is a, uh, a well-loved and beat-up mitten. Uh, there are some here that is in a stitch called Coppergate uh, that's not too different from that basic stitch. So there is there's exactly one find of nail binding from England, uh, from what is now the city of York on Coppergate, the street of the cup makers. And uh, it was a sock rather than a mitten there, but uh, we'll get to the socks in a minute. And there are a couple other uh, mittens here and a, an Oslo stitch and a Mammon stitch. And again, we'll talk to, about stitches in a bit. Um, so that one sock looks vaguely like this one that I've recreated here. 
and uh, it's a fairly simple low sock. You'll, you'll find a, a similar looking one on my foot. Uh, this is just out of a plain undyed uh, white wool with a little bit of a, a matter red uh, trim around it. And I have uh, a similar sock. We'll turn this sideways. I don't know if this will turn or not. Yep, there we go. Uh, so this is out of a green wool that I did for my son. And for that same uh, winter demo, my wife had me make her some very tall socks so that she stays warm. And we'll talk a little bit about needles here. So there we go. So I've got a variety of different needles here. So these are, uh, some of them are made of wood like these ones and a basic wood needle works just fine. There's a couple there that are made out of uh, walnut or some sort of darker colored woods. Um, I have a needle like this one that is made out of bone. Bone, bone uh, polishes up very nicely and works quite well for that. I've got a needle here made of antler, also works quite well. Now bone and antler, you have to be a little careful working because the uh, dust can be a bit of a problem. And there's my favorite sort of larger size needle again, uh, made out of bone. Uh, does anybody have any questions about stuff on the table before we wander on? I guess I could talk a little bit about wool. So uh, probably my favorite wool to work, work with is an Icelandic wool called Lopi or Elephas Lopi in this case. Um, this is a moderately chunky wool. So the, the thicker the wool you use, the coarser the product you'll get out of the end, but the faster it will go. If you use a really fine wool like these uh, Coppergate socks or a, a finer wool, and that's more like the original was based on. Uh, it'll take more stitches to make a sock, but it will be smoother when you're all done. Um, so today we're gonna, I'm gonna demonstrate with a, a fairly chunky wool. Uh, my wife Rylan was a member of a weaver and spinner guild for a long time and got a, a, a bunch of wool that somebody had spun. So this is probably about a, I wanna say millimeter and a half to two millimeter thick wool. Okay. So let's go back over to the desktop here. I'm gonna turn off the video on my handheld. So how does this work? I know several of you mentioned that you may have some experience in knitting or with uh, crochet. Um, so this is a little bit different than knitting. It's probably closer than crochet, but a bit different than, than all of them. In fact, I'm gonna get one more thing and that is just a small sample that has started. And we'll talk about the differences from those skills. So I've got my uh, camera tilted down here. So hopefully we can put it on the table and look at it. Uh, so a lot of the things like hats or mittens are started in a spiral. So you start with the center point and you go around and around in a circle. And unlike crochet or knitting, which is done by sort of looping together making loops that are not entirely sewn together. Nail binding works by putting a single piece of yarn through your needle and then every stitch is basically a stitch through the the wool and around and pulled all the way through. So, so if you had a mile of yarn it would take you a very long time to pull it. In the case of nail binding you're more likely to work with a short length of course, you, in front of the camera, you can't see how long this is, but the, the piece I have here is maybe 18 inches long. And uh, I know it's been conjectured that they might have done nail binding with all the offcuts from weaving, where, where you get short pieces that you can't really use at the end of, of the weaving. So let's take a look at how you might start this. Um, so if I was gonna start from scratch, and if anybody wanna follow along, you're welcome to do so. I'm gonna take my nice little blunt nail binding needle I'm gonna thread it onto one end of a piece of yarn. And I'm gonna assume that we're building something, well, honestly for today, it's gonna to turn out to look like a little tiny doily like this, but that could quite readily be the top of a hat or the end of a mitten or the end of a sock, but we're gonna start at the center and spiral out. Um, so what I usually do to start is make a, a little slip knot. So I'm gonna fold over the yarn and I'm going to leave maybe three or four inches of tail and I'm going to tuck that part through the loop to make a little sliding knot. So I don't know if you can see that there. So if I tug on the loop to make it larger, then the small tail will move. And uh, you're going to have to bear with me for camera directions and things like this. And 
in my case, I tend to lay it out and orient it like it was a number six where the long tail of the yarn that's attached to the needle goes out the top and the loop is down the bottom. And then I'm going to pinch that knot and, and use that to work from. Uh, so feel free to uh, stop me if I'm going too fast or if you have any questions here. Um, so the next thing I'm going to do, I, I know some of you mentioned that you do crochet. So I, I, I am led to believe that a, a spiral start around a center is not unusual in crochet as well. I have to confess, I got into nail binding having done chain mail. And chain mail shares some similarities in that you have a bunch of separate rings, whereas here there'll be loops of yarn. Um, so I'm going to take my needle, I'm going to drop it into that center hole and up on the outside. So I'm kind of going from five o'clock to about 11 o'clock on the clock. And I'm going to pull it until there's a little loop on there. Sir Edward, we have a question from Gus. He asks, is a wider needle better than a narrow needle? So the one thing I would say about your needle is it should be blunt enough that it's likely to go between the strands of yarn, not split into the strands of the yarn. So if you had a sharp darning needle or something like that, you're, you're likely to have the problem that when you go to sew with it, you end up splitting your yarn and you don't really want that to happen. Other than that, the diameter of the needle will sort of determine the smallest uh, or the, the smallest the holes can be. If you had a needle that was a millimeter or two across, um, it could go in a very small hole. And if you wanted to do really fine nail binding, you'd want a smaller needle. The ones I have here are probably about eight millimeters, if I had to guess, on the, on the strong side of a quarter inch. And I've certainly seen people that use curved needles. I've seen people that use round profile. Like if you look at this one, it is sort of flat on side, but rounded on the edges. Um, so I would say there's a lot of personal preference going on there. Okay, so if we take a look at this starting spot, I'm gonna to try to orient it so it's uh, sticking up here. So we'll put it that direction. So the, the yarn that's, that's heading towards the top of your screen now is, is the strand that goes to the needle. The loop at the bottom is, is gonna be your center. And I've just put one stitch into it and I've basically gone down through the outside and up under the, the side of the wool. And it's making sort of a clockwise spiral. So I'm gonna put the next stitch in here. So again, I'm gonna go down through that same center loop and we're gonna put at least about half a dozen and maybe as many as 10 or 12 uh, stitches into this very center loop. So down through the center and over the other one and pull. And we're gonna gradually get a number of stitches spiraling around that center. So we'll do another one here, down through the center. Now, if you notice the way these are working, the, the stitches I'm putting in are just interlocking with one existing stitch. And in terms of nail binding stitches, this is about as simple as you're gonna get. Uh, if we get time further on towards the end of our class, we'll talk about some different stitches and how, how, how they differ from this one, but this is about your, your most simple stitch you can do. My, my first uh, set of two or three hats and mittens or pairs of mittens were all the same stitch and probably a slightly thicker wool even. Edward, historically, do we see um, a combination of different stitches used in the same item? I don't know if I've seen uh, multiple in the same uh, find. Um, the, the number of finds of nail binding we have, I think are pretty limited overall and exactly yeah. how complete those objects are. So the, the example from England from Coppergate, there's one stitch that's used throughout that item as best they can tell. Uh, somebody mes mentioned Oslo stitch, which I think is, uh, there is a find, might even be mittens from, from Oslo, so that, that's what they've been named after. Um, there, there are examples of nail binding that go through our period and beyond. In fact, I think there was still a little bit of nail binding being done right up to the 20th century in Scandinavia, though worldwide, I think it had been mostly supplanted by knitting. And I would say in the last 20 years or so, there's been a real resurgence as people are, are, are finding uh, interest in it again. A lot of reenactors like ourselves. 
Um, so I haven't personally seen cases of, of mixing and matching stitches, although I have to confess if I'm starting something with a more complicated stitch, I'll do a loop of this basic stitch to start it out. Um, because basically you want to get a circle with a bunch of loops on it and, and then expand from there. So, yeah. so if you look at this one, I've got this center loop that I have enlarged by using that sliding, uh, sliding knot initially. And I've got- We do have a question from Gus as well. He okay. asks uh, whether nail bound uh, items are warmer than knitted items. I don't know if I can say that they're warmer or not. I would say they're comparable because mostly the, uh, um, if, if the wool is the same, the, um, the warmth comes from the air trapped in, inside it. Um, so I've certainly found good success staying warm with, with nail bound mittens and socks and that kind of thing. And with wool, uh, more, more modern knitting styles as well. Um, so I would say I it's comparable. Add, mm -hmm. uh, I found that the null binding is way denser than uh, definitely crochet, but also knitting and would be warmer just because of that. But that's just a thought. Okay, uh, it could certainly be true. Thank you, Janine. Uh, another uh, comment I can make about nail binding, let me uh, get another piece as a prop. If, if you were to knit something and then took a piece of scissors and cut it, um, the knitting wouldn't fare very well for it. I have, I have this pair of uh, socks. These ones are probably a dozen or so years old and uh, well loved. And at some point I put a big hole in them. In fact, you can see the remnant of the toe here that has a couple of rather large holes in them. And what I did was I took a piece of scissors and I cut off the toe. And you can see the cut edge there. And then I took the remaining sock that would have eventually been here and pulled all the fluffy little bits out that were cut off and I nail bound back down to the toe and rebuilt it. And the nice thing with nail binding, because every stitch is pulled all the way through, you could actually cut it and here we'll see if we can pull some of these out but other than the actual cut pieces of yarn this is still intact um, so you could nail bind a tubular shape and cut it in half to make it into a rectangle and use it as a scarf and that would be a perfectly viable way to to use nail binding if, if there's a downside of nail binding compared to knitting it's that it's probably a little bit slower to do uh, and the uh, amount of product that you turn out in a um, amount of time would be a little slower but uh, i think the downside compared to knitting and crochet is that you can't unrip it <laughs> you, there is that yes if you want it back because you're making knots as opposed to yeah very true there's yes, no you... there's no pulling back to to yeah. a, a different point if you mess up there's no frogging yes yes now i i'm a nail binder i'm not a knitter I can back up a little bit, assuming my stitches are not too tight. So if I was to look at these stitches here, I'll put another one in. If I pull one through, I'm making it snug enough that I can get the needle through, but not really too small. So there's probably close to a centimeter inside the circumference of, or a centimeter diameter in, in the, each of the stitch rings there. You could make it a lot tighter if you wanted, but then it would certainly be hard to back up. If if I'm doing it this loose, I could put a needle in and I can pull one stitch out and back it up, but it's a little slow that way. So it's certainly not as, as slow to take out as uh, knitting or crocheting. Okay, let's get back to our circle here so we can get uh, people going on this. So I've got about four stitches around the, the center circle here. So I'm gonna put a few more stitches in and I'm gonna try to get to about uh, maybe 10 or 12. So again, through, down through the center, up to the outside, and pull. Down through the center, up again through the previous stitch, and pull. You'll have to let me know if this is possible to follow on the camera, because I know it can be a challenge to learn nail binding online. Uh, as somebody's pointed out, there are some very good videos out there. Um, but my experience has been it's hard to beat somebody sitting beside you with the needles that can look at what you're doing and compare. Okay, I find, so. I find the challenge with the video lessons is uh, sometimes your hands get in the way and I can't see, <laughs> I can't see everything you're doing. Not you specifically, but other videos that are on YouTube. Yep, I can understand that. And the, the challenge I'm finding is I'm trying to orient this near the camera, but also where I can see it. And 
because of like mirror imaging and things exactly which direction you're going is, is harder to follow. So if people can see this, I'm probably somewhere around halfway around the circle here. But because the center is a slip knot, I can actually make that center smaller by tugging on the this lighting end. So I'm going to put a couple more stitches on and then we're going to go around to the next part. So we'll throw one in here. So what I've got here looks almost like a little flower with petals around the outside and a slightly bigger center. That's looking pretty good. That's probably close to 10 stitches. So if I take that sliding knot at the bottom and tug on the, the movable end, the center will get pretty small. Mm -hmm. And now I'm not quite a full circle, but pretty close. So get it centered there a little bit better. So to close this in, I'm going to turn this around in my hand and I'm going to point which was originally the, our, our starting spot where this loose tail is up. And my next stitches are going to start going through sort of the, the stitches in the first row that we put in. So if I hold this tail down out of the way, instead of going through the very center, I'm going to go through our first stitch and then again up through the last stitch in the current row. And we'll continue our clockwise spiral here. Now, I don't know if you can see on there, I've got about six inches of wool left. I would normally go with a fairly generous arm length as a base. And I'll show you later how you can cheat and use probably a double or more as much wool at a time. Um, an advantage of nail binding is that you can work with very small pieces, but you can also use longer than that and not have to splice on wool quite as often. Okay, so now let's talk about shaping. So the piece I have here is about the size of my thumb and it's got eh, maybe 10 or 12 stitches around. If I go around and I put one new stitch in each stitch I have here, then the next row is also gonna have 12 stitches and the row after that is also gonna have 12 stitches. And if I wanted to make the finger of a glove that was pretty small, then that's great. If I wanna make a hat, it's not gonna be big enough to fit on my head. So let's imagine that we want this to enlarge a little bit. So if you can imagine that we've got one center link, we've got a dozen stitches around it, and now we're gonna start into the third row. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, can having just put it yep go ahead um when you're building that first loop are you going clockwise or counterclockwise so i've been moving around it clockwise okay so i i held the uh knot at about the seven o'clock uh point and i've been sort of stitching in the top right quadrant and then turning it to go around clockwise and there's no particular reason you have to be consistent in your direction um, I, I often find if I'm teaching somebody who is left-handed, I will sit directly across from them. And then effectively what you're stitching will be a mirror image. And if I'm teaching somebody who's right-handed, I'll try to sit beside them so they can look from the same direction that you're doing it. Okay, thanks. <laughs> so, so either of those would work fine. Okay, so if I want this to get bigger, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the the stitch on the second row that I just added a stitch to, and I'm gonna put my needle back down through that same loop and up into the last stitch again. So effectively, I've put two stitches in row three where there were only one stitch in row one. Or sorry, two, two in the second uh, ring where there was only one in the first ring. And then I'm gonna get, you can see this again, I'm going to find the next stitch that is it around that circle. I'm going to go down through that one and up through the current one and pull. And I'm going to put a second stitch down to that first one and up through the last stitch and pull. So what I would normally do is I would start with a single stitch in the center. I would put depending on how pointy the object you're trying to make is, probably about 10 or 12 around the next one. And that works well for the end of a sock or the top of a hat. Um, and then add two stitches for each one all the way around. And then at some point you need to reduce the speed at which you're adding new stitches. Um, so I would do a single ring, a dozen, 
double that to about 24, and then probably add a stitch about every second one. But we've hit the next exciting point of this, which is since I started with a very small piece of yarn, I'm kind of out of room. And I stop when the amount that's left is about the length of the needle you're working with, because it gets hard to work with there. So what do we do to add more yarn? So I'm going to go back to my spool of yarn. I'm going to pull off a generous arm length, and I'm doing sort of fingertip to nose. And I often just break the yarn off by pulling, but you could cut it with a pair of scissors or snips or whatever you've got. And uh, the yarn I've got here, maybe a two ply. And if not, you can sort of split it into a couple of separate parts. So what we want to do is splice these together. And I don't know if one of the uh, knitters or crocheters on, on the call here can, can comment. Do you guys do this in crochet? Or is it an infrequent enough occurrence that, it, that you don't need to? I don't do it as much in crochet because we get to go from one end of the, the skein of yarn to the other. Um, yeah, and but I've gotten really comfortable doing it with null binding. Yeah, yep. when, you, when you knit, you're using a, as, like you're kind of going right from the ball, you're using it very continuously. So, yep. yeah. but at the end of a ball. Sometimes if you want to change a color, you, you have yeah. to switch balls and, and you have to cut that. And there are different ways of, of splicing yarn if you don't want to weave in the ends mm -hmm. um, and make a little half knot, but. Okay. So I'll show you one, one way you can, you can uh, splice your yarn in here. So I'm working with pure wool yarn and I am led to believe that if you had acrylic yarn, it doesn't do this very well, but That's wool true. works out nicely. So I split the ends into two separate parts and I've sort of vaguely interleaved them together. And I'm just going to wet my fingers and rub the yarn between my hands. And the combination of a little bit of moisture and some friction and the warmth will make the wool fibers try to grab together. And you can see it, it's, it's a little bit of a bulky spot there, but it's not too bad. And then I'm going to spin it in the direction that the yarn is already twisted. And ideally, I have a piece that looks like it's just another piece of yarn. Now, depending on how well that's spliced together, you want to be a little bit cautious for your next couple of stitches. Uh, so I'm going to take my, the end of my yarn. So a trick you can use to use longer pieces of yarn is instead of putting just a single piece through my needle, I've got a needle with a slightly larger eye and I'm going to double up the, the yarn coming through. So if you can see it, I've basically got the yarn, I'm trying to get this near the camera. I've got effectively four lengthy yarn going through here. And that means I won't have to pull it as far to get it to, to come through. The downside, of course, is that that gets bulkier to go through your, through your nail binding through the previous stitch. Okay, so if I look back at where we were here before we had displays, I've just put a stitch in and in the previous row, there were two stitches through this ring. So I'm gonna go back to the next ring before and I'm gonna go down through one and up through the last one. And pull. And just to be cautious about my splice here, I'm going to give that another twist because I don't want that unrolling on me. Once this is uh, together into a, a hat or a sock or whatever, you'll find that this uh, holds together pretty well. And uh, as you wear them, depending on what they are, they may uh, felt or full pretty well. Okay, so I'm going to put a second stitch down through that same loop and up. So I'm trying to keep my tension consistent here. Um, some of this is determined by the size of the needle. So um, if I pull it much more than this, when the needle goes through, it will stretch it out. Uh, There's some other stitches that we all talk about in a little bit uh, that, that use some other tricks for tensioning. In particular, stitches that use a finger or your thumb as the sizing. Okay, so for people that are listening in here, how many would like to go through more of this or how many would like to talk about other stitches? Is uh, further around uh, this circle the next place to go? Sir Edward, uh, your class was scheduled for one hour, but I've received a message saying that you can go over if there's uh, a, um, you know, a good discussion going and we wanna continue. Okay, that sounds good. As long as we're not conflicting with everybody, I'm. Happy to stick around and answer questions or do more of this. Lucy has a question. She asks, what is this stitch called? So 
So I just call this a basic stitch. I, I don't know of a particular find of this style, uh, but we can talk a little bit about stitch types and how they compare. Um, one, one of the uh, early researchers into nail binding had a set of um, sort of codes for describing what a stitch looked like. And the way they, they labeled their stitches is based on where the needle went and where the yarn traveled. So if you imagine that you're going into the previous stitch here, um, they would describe this as a stitch that, that started from the front of the previous row and went under this yarn and then went over and over the yarn on the way out. So it would be under, over, over. And the, uh, the copper gate sock that we were talking about that was found in England is the same sort of mechanic, but it goes through more stitches. So instead of just going through the last stitch here, it would go through two stitches and the copper gate stitch would be under, under, over, over, over. So if I was to stitch it from here, it would go under these two on the way in and it would go over one, two, three on the way out. Like so. So you end Sir, up with sort of it. Go on. Sir. Sir Edward, um, for Gus, could you please demonstrate reattaching or attaching two strands together again? Sure, I can do that. I'm going to grab a different piece of uh, wool here, but we'll splice one on. So I'm just going to take a, a short length of wool, like so. Need this to stop where the camera is actually pointing. That would be helpful. Uh, so I've got two pieces of this yarn. I'm going to take the piece that I would be working with, and this would normally just be a, the short stub at the end of, of your uh, nail binding. So you'd probably only have two or three inches and then your, your piece would be there. So I have un, unspliced it a couple of inches, maybe uh, five centimeters, depending if you're a metric person. And I'll do the same on the incoming piece. So those are all split apart. Um, there's no hard and fast rule of about two and two. I, I know some of the yarn I've used had four plies and you just sort of spread them out as well as you can. So I've interleaved these into each other because you want to get the uh, wool where it's got enough surface on either piece to, to join together. So the four of those are just sort of stacked up. So I've got about two inches of overlap all told. And then I'm going to apply some moisture give it a little bit of a, a roll between my hands. Now, my understanding is that the um, wool strands have a characteristic where they it allows them to latch onto each other when agitated like you're doing that. Yep, exactly. And if you're if you had a wool garment and you were going to put it in the wash, the, the combination of water and agitation and uh, possibly soap and Fulling? warmth addition fulling. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. And if you wanted to make felt, you would do a lot of that. If you're working on your nail binding, you're just trying to, to splice it together. So you can give that a look. So essentially what we've done is we've convinced a bunch of those wool fibers to grab onto the fibers from the other end. Now, if I was to give that a pull without twisting it, it's not all that strong yet. But if I first twist it back together, now I tug on it. That's, that's pretty good. So again, when you go to put that back into your nail binding. You want to be a little bit cautious and not put it under too much pressure until it's stitched in. But once you're a couple of stitches back, then uh, that works it okay. So if people are good, I'll go back to our, our first little circle here. We so have another question. Um, how do you tell when you finished a round? How do you finish a round? So this is kind of a continuous spiral. So there's no hard and fast count, although I guess if you wanted to count stitches, you could. Uh, what I tend to do is I, I know where my, my center is and I, I estimate how many stitches it looks like it needs to go around. Um, the next time around is again an estimate when you've gone approximately double that number of stitches, that's fine. Uh, if you were working on a, a piece that had contrasting colors, let me grab a hat here that's got that um, if you're switching from one color to another, it's much easier to tell when you've gotten 
a circle. Because if you look at the, the hat here, this was red for a very long time. And I spliced in the black yarn right about here. And you would get one row of black all the way around. Well, when your black gets back to the end, that one's easy to read. If you're doing it all one monocolor, it's much more of an estimate of how far around you've gone. One trick might be to use um, stitch markers like you do with knitting and crochet. That also applies here. Yeah, that could certainly work. So if you had a contrasting color of yarn and mm -hmm. you could uh, stick one through at a particular point, do you tie them off in a little knot or just sort of uh, pin them or through just, or something? Yeah, just let it lay, yeah. Yep, just like so. So we could mark it there with a with a contrasting piece. Let's see if we can bring this one off. There we go. You you can kind of read the stitches you've already done, but it it takes a lot of practice, <laughs> and it's I still find it way easier to read knitting or even crochet, and I'm not very good at crochet. Um, but you yeah, me too. Like if you look if you've done this little bit so far, um, you can kind of see that the stitches, how they go, if you sort of open it up, you can see that you've got two side by side in in one loop from the one before. Yep, like this one. So, but it really, it took me ages to even begin to comprehend this bit in null binding, and I'm a knitting person, so it's not it's not the easiest. We have another uh, question. Is, um, sure. How do you turn the flat spiral into the tube? So if I was to take the, uh, the spiral here, uh, so I, I've gone from one stitch to 12 stitches to probably about 24 stitches around. If I was to stop adding new stitches, so here I've been doing one stitch through and a second in the same spot. Um, if I wanted this to stay exactly this size, I would just put one stitch in every one. So as I went around, I would put one stitch here, I would put one stitch here, I would put one stitch here. And that would make the size stay consistent all the way down. So if you can imagine that your, uh, your stitches are about a millimeter across and you've got 24 of them around, it's gonna be a consistent circumference around that tube at that point. So that this at this point would make a pretty good thumb on a mitten maybe even a slightly generously sized one. Now, conversely, if I wanted this to be a hat, um, I'm gonna go flat for a little while longer, but then I'm probably gonna expand gently. So if you were to look at this hat, beyond that sort of first couple of rows, a lot of this is sort of adds one stitch every second stitch as you go around. So you would put one stitch through and then two, and then one and then two, alternating. Now we're creeping up on a quarter to eight. So let's talk a little bit about different stitches. So we talked about this. This is the most basic stitch you're gonna find. Um, there is a lady from Finland that has a great site that has an analysis of a whole bunch of different styles of stitches uh, with lots of U's and O's and, and whatnot. There's a sort of different style of, of nail binding uh, that instead of using the needle for tension uses your thumb for tension. Uh, and somebody mentioned Oslo stitch. So Oslo stitch is one of the stitches that is well suited to, to uh, thumb tensioning. So if I was to try to do Oslo stitch the same way we were doing the stitch we're doing right now, just by the needle going back and forth, you can imagine it as kind of a two phase stitch. So I would pick up a stitch from the previous row. I would come up through the stitch we're going through from here, and then I'm gonna pull it part way through, and then it would go it has gone under this stitch, it would go over the next stitch, then it would turn around and come back the other way, under, over, over. So it would be UO slash UOO. And it, it gives you a stitch with this little crisscross in the middle of it, uh, which is kind of cool. And if you look at this hat, this hat is made with Oslo stitch and it's got a pretty good stretch to it especially if your, your stitches are not too small, but you can see that sort of characteristic crisscross all the way along. So if you wanted to do this using your thumb as a spacer, you can basically open up the stitch and put it around your thumb. And the way this is often done is by 
dropping your needle through, picking up a stitch behind your thumb and then sticking it through. And effectively that's gotten you your under, over, under, over, over, all in one motion. And if you have a thumb that is substantially smaller than mine, it might be the perfect size already for your nail binding. Um, if I use my thumb and I don't retention, I get a stitch that is really quite large. Um, so what I end up doing, so that would be my no retentioning size, which is probably two or two and a half times the size of the stitches we were doing before. So I'll, I will end up pulling that up tighter if we're gonna do it that way. Okay, do we wanna talk a little bit more about stitch types or go back to our circle? So I, I've just thrown a, a, a wrench into this particular one in that we've switched stitches halfway through, but. Uh, we are now at 10 to 8 p.m. So if we were on a hard deadline, we would have five minutes of uh, wrap up. So why don't we do, uh, if anybody has any questions that we haven't answered yet, we'll do that. And then we can carry on and do a little bit more if people would like to, to continue. I'm gonna play the how to back up if you decide you don't like that stitch and wanna do something different. So I'm just gonna use my needle, having removed it from the yarn to pull that one back where it came from. Back that stitch out. And then I've got one more of those Oslo stitch ones. The loopier your stitch is, the harder it is to back up this way. Um, I could also, if I was feeling lazy, just cut it and splice on another piece of yarn, but uh, this should back up okay. Sir Edward, do you always or primarily use the, the flat as opposed to going around your thumb? Uh, so if I'm doing Oslo stitch, I do find the on your thumb works pretty well. And I do like mm -hmm. that method. Uh, and if my wife was the nail binder in the family, she could probably use her thumb and not retention at all. Uh, so I do, the, the big advantage of the thumb is it lets you make a bunch of those stitches quickly. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm doing a copper gate stitch, uh, which is a lot like that basic one, but sort of two, back through two instead of back uh, only through one, uh, then I'll tend to just do it on the flat. So if okay. I'm doing this basic one, it's just needle tension. I'm going to pull through and I'm just going to sort of eyeball the tension. And you'll find the first couple of things you make, your tension will be all over the place. Mm -hmm. And that's normal. Don't feel bad about it. Um, as you get going, you can decide what tension you like. So here I'm pulling it through and then just looking at the tension going, yeah, it looks about right. Okay. Um, the, the stitches we've been doing here, all of them start by getting one stitch from the previous row and then going back through the current row. There are some stitches that will get two stitches of the previous row. Uh, if you wanted to, then it's just a slightly different attachment. I, I've often said that if, if you're doing the same thing every time, you're doing nail binding. I might not know what stitch it is. It may not be named after a particular <laughs> find, but it's still nail binding. And if it's always the same, then it's at least consistent. Yeah, uh, we have uh, cool. another couple Thank questions you. here. Sure. Uh, what is what is the craziest material you have used and what is the nicest? And then there's a, a second question that's not related to that question. Okay, so uh, the, the most common material I've used has been this wool. The craziest material I've uh, used would probably be, uh, I did a sample piece out of paracord. <laughs> Uh, my thought being, if I was presenting for a big group, then if you're like, this is what, an eighth to a quarter of an inch diameter, somewhere I have a needle that's about, I don't know, six or eight inches long and about an inch or more wide. Uh, I couldn't find it today, but uh, that, that is probably one of the crazier ones I've worked with. Uh, I made Rylan a hat out of mohair once. Um, and the mohair was very, I want to say, loopy, not, not only was it grabby like wool, but it was twisty. Um, so that was a challenge. Um, I, I would have to say that the, uh, the Merino that this red and black hat is made out of was probably some of the nicest. It's very soft, very comfy and uh, nice to work with. Uh, it's a little smaller diameter than what I use most often. So uh, there's sort of a trade-off between how dense you want it to be. Uh, I've certainly seen some nail binding that is very, very dense. Um, 
if I was to compare the piece I was just working with for with a sock that I made for my son long, long ago, the uh, the size of the stitches here, I don't know if you can see them, um, I would probably have to almost double them to even just get this needle through. Now, part of that is because the wool is smaller diameter. Um, it's partly because I was just working with a tighter tension at the time and a smaller needle. And the other thing you'll find, if you look at the bottom of the sock, where Jared, of course, got them wet and ran around on things, it's uh, rather nicely uh, felted on the bottom of the sock. Let's see if the second one in here is any different. Nope, all pretty, uh, yes. Anybody that knows Jared now would know he could sort of wear this on his thumb and that would be a <laughs> He was probably about six or seven at the time that I made those and uh, which means they didn't fit very long, but, but hey. They, they've been a, a staple of my nail binding. Here, here's some stuff I made uh, group since then because he, he didn't manage to wear them out before he outgrew them. How did you shape the sock itself? Okay, so uh, shaping on here. So if you look at this one, so this would be the same spiral start at the end and expanding down to about the yeah, two, two inch mark. And then it's a straight tube from there down to about here. And then this particular one uses a back and forth sort of a zigzag. So I would run a set of stitches across to here and then I turned it around and went backwards. So it's back and forth and back and forth this way. And then I basically straighted another one that went around from that point. And here it was zigzagged around the heel. So around the outside that way. So there's sort of zigzags across the bottom and then zigzags across the back. And then at some point, you get far enough up the ankle that you can just do a full circle. I've been uh, experimenting with some different uh, shaping techniques recently. Uh, if I was to pull out a mitten, so the mitten here is very much like a sock till you get down to this point. And then the uh, one of the advantages of Oslo stitch and the other loopier stitches, you can kind of do them not just on the flat, but also in a chain. Um, so in the case of this one, I stopped at the point of the thumb and then I did a chain of stitch that went around the back of the thumb and then I joined it back on. So there was a little slit left for the thumb and then I finished it back down to the wrist. And then for the thumb part, I basically went around that opening and then down towards the point of the thumb zoop, that way. Mm. Um, I, I did some before where you basically did this thumb as if it was a separate garment. You started at the tip of the thumb. I'm having trouble getting this one on camera here, sorry. Um, and then ran back to the towards the, the hand and then stitched them on. So there's some other possibilities there. Um, another technique that I've seen people use is to start with a chain instead of with the point. Uh, so somewhere, I don't think I have them anymore. I did a set of mittens and I started with a ring around the wrist and basically did that chain until it went all the way around. And then I went that way back down towards the fingers and leaving, leaving the thumb aside, you can keep it more or less consistent down to here. And then instead of putting two stitches in one, you would pick up two stitches and reduce the number of stitches around. So you get down to that very central point. So we have another question here. Sure. Um, how did an interest in chain mail bring you to this? And can you do this with wire? Uh, I would imagine you could absolutely do this with wire. There, there is some metallic trim that might also be Viking age that seems to share some similarities to this style, but I could certainly see it working with wire. I uh, wonder if that's Viking wire weaving though. Yeah, Viking wire weaving. Trichinopoly. If, yeah, uh, if you, if you think about how it works, yes, uh, yeah. it might very well have a lot of in, in common with this. Yeah, I've, done some, I've done some research into that and um, if you were to do like one step even simpler than what we've been doing, if you just sort of do go into a circle and then up through that same loop. Um, yeah, if you can, it, if you can imagine is, uh, taking my nail binding and putting it around a dowel, yeah, Viking wire weaving looks same, an awful lot like... Yeah, it's yeah, the like, same looping motion in yep. wire sort of like this um so if you took just, your wire and applied it to your uh yeah it's when you start getting into the like 
putting your loops up one or two to make a denser wire woven chain that you that it starts to deviate from null binding. Yeah, um, cert certainly, uh, I, I would think you could take the skills learned on one of those crafts and apply it to the other one. Is there another question as well? That is the um, the last question we have in the chat box. Does anyone have any that they would like to ask, Sir Edward? What else have you made? What What else have I made? So, were Were you here for the uh, mobile mobile tour of my tabletop over here? No, I. I it took me a while missed, to get in. that one. Okay, so for anybody that missed it here, we'll take we'll take the mobile on the run. So Skya, if you want to, I'll start the video up on my uh, mobile phone and you can see my desk here. If you wanted to spotlight that one, you can see my cat. I don't get credit for that part. Uh, so I don't need to join the audio. That would get confusing. So on the table here, I've got uh, a few different hats. I had a, a, a more or less match set for Ryan and Yobiarn, a blue one of mine and the red one I, I've shown a little more. I've got a variety of mittens here. So they're the basic stitch we've been doing today is what we used for this one. And that was one of the, the first mittens I made. Um, it may have been used in a campfire and got a little bit singed and shrunk and everything else. Uh, there's a set here that's done in the Coppergate sketch. So uh, that's the under, under, over, over, over stitch. Uh, so if you, you'll find this one is a little stretchier than the basic stitch we've been doing. Uh, but has a tendency to, to twist in a spiral. Uh, there's a, the gray mittens here are in Oslo stitch. And there's a set I made for Ryland. So this is a mammon stitch. So if you, if you imagine an Oslo stitch, but doubled up, mammon is sort of like that. It's, it's probably the, one of the more dense uh, stitches that I've done. Uh, again, these ones have a little bit of uh, campfire use behind them. Uh, my first set of Coppergate socks or the remnants of them, I might actually have to admit these ones are done because the, the part that I'm saving is, is getting less and less. So these have been taken apart and darned and put back together. There's another Coppergate light sock. Um, put this back up. There's a set of rather big socks I did for Ryland here. So these are more or less the same sock style at the bottom and then from the ankle, they, they expand up and these are above the knee height. Uh, so that same uh, demo I was talking about, we, we did a demo with a Viking group in Toronto for a number of years for a Richmond Hill winter carnival. And uh, we've seen some cold weather. In fact, one year it was so cold, the high for the weekend was negative 25 Celsius. And uh, spending your time eight hours a day outside in the cold in, in Viking clothing and that weather reminds you exactly how good uh, this stuff is at uh, keeping you warm. Okay, I'm gonna turn the uh, mobile camera off here. We'll go back to the desktop one. So I know you don't knit, but would you say that it's easier to repair a nile binded piece than a knitted piece? I would think it is likely easier to repair if only because uh, it doesn't suffer from unraveling. So uh, if you were to take a knitted sweater or a pair of socks or something and you had to repair it, you, I, I guess you've got to stop what you've got there from unraveling further. Whereas the, uh, the sock that I mended here, uh, you can take a look at this one. So the, this one has had the tip of the sock cut off and then added back down to the toe. I don't know if you can see the contrasting color on the camera there, but I cut the entire heel out of it and then added a new heel back in. So and you I'm thinking the piece I put back in here is a little pointier than it needs to be, but that was basically redone as a spiral all the way around this bottom and down to the point. Do this with embroidery thread too, I guess. Any, if you yeah, wanted probably. to. Uh, yep, you certainly could. Um, I know uh, nail binding was pretty popular in places like uh, Finland, and there are some traditional, like they're post period from an SEA perspective, but traditional nail bound mittens there often have some pretty good embroidery on the uh, cuffs. 
uh, I think the most embroidery I've done on stuff that I have here would be just a, a, a basic, uh, this is like a herringbone stitch around our, the cuff of Ryland's uh, mittens here. It's a little less herringbone than it once was. But uh, again, these are well loved. But uh, a little bit of embroidery on the top is certainly easy to do. The uh, contrasting color is always uh, fun to work with. The uh, the sock from Coppergate, uh, they did some analysis of it. And I think when they dug it up, it just looks sort of like brown and beat up. But the uh, the theory was that the bulk of the sock was undyed, but there was a little bit of a residue of matter, which would be a, a reddish or orangish dye uh, around the uh, trim. So I've added a little bit of trim to that one. Um, I keep saying that I'm going to do a hat with a spiral and make a Where's Waldo hat. If you if you did red and white and use two two needles, you could go around and around in a circle, and you'd get that change of color every uh, every row. So, uh, lo lots of possibilities there. Sir Edward, do you find that after wear, um, the the item falls? I. At I, all? I I certainly do do find it uh, in particular with socks. Um, so if you can look at uh, this one, there's some pretty substantial fulling to the bottom of this sock. And the other thing you'll find, uh, this this particular sock is pretty old, so it's getting a little thinner in the center section here, but there's a lot more fulling out towards the toe. Uh, if we were to look at Ryland socks here, you can see the the bottom of the sock. It's almost hard to pick out where the stitches are as compared to up towards the knee where there's a lot less fulling or felting going on. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say that's pretty common. You could, if you wanted to, deliberately full or felt your garment as you make it. Um, so I've seen some mittens that certainly look like they were made extra large and, and then basically get them wet and rub them together and, and work on felting them deliberately. Um, I would think that would cut down on the gaps between them if you wanted them to be more windproof, that would mm -hmm. certainly be a feature. I've done that a couple of times, uh, felted bags down, and it works really well, depending on the wool you choose. But I really like that. Mm -hmm. This is one of these cases where going with a pure wool uh, would make a difference in how much it's going to fall. Um, if you had a blend that was like some of the uh, mod modern materials they use for wool coats and things like that. I think I've got like nylon or something in them. And uh, <laughs> I don't think weird. that would fell, that wouldn't <laughs> felt, felt nearly as well. And I know there yeah. are people that, that will do nail binding with something like acrylic. And yeah. I think you can't even splice those together. <laughs> so I, I have don't to know confess, how you do that. I, I've never worked in acrylic. I don't know how it works. I probably have some knitted hats from when I was a kid that, that were acrylic, but yeah, um, seems weird. Is there anyone who would like to show, Sir Edward, what you've worked on? I can cancel the spotlight video so you can show him what you've worked on. Yeah, put it up in uh, chat mode and if people have got other stuff here. Okay. Hey Gus. <laughs> Turn this back to a little more of a point, point at me instead of point at my, uh, my desktop. I am working on um, basically a, uh, I don't know, what uh, uh, trivet? That's it. Okay, <laughs> sounds pretty good. Doilies were all the rage when I started. <laughs> Can never go wrong with somewhere to put the tea. Yeah, uh, often good. If you happen to have a small round cup, you can expand that into a cup warmer without too much trouble, oh. and, and then work on your uh, tapering of. Uh... Where would I get my cold tea? <laughs> Maybe it'll keep it cold if it's already cold. <laughs> I have some things to show, but I'm very technology, technologically challenged, so probably not today. <laughs> showing, oh, sorry. Uh, showing null binding things or just any craft in general? Null binding. Oh, dang. Mm -hmm. This is what I attempted to do. This is about as far as I got just now. Okay, well, that's pretty good. I miss the, um, is that working? I don't know. I missed yep. my, oh, there we go. I missed the beginning part, which is what I wanted to see about how to start it in a circle, because I only know how to start a line and then make it, so this is like the bottom part of the hat, and then you connect it, and then you go smaller. 
So, and this wool I got on sale and it's 50% wool, 50% acrylic. And it felt okay. You just have to be really gentle. Mm -hmm. And so you can, oh, where's my little thing? Yeah, the ends come apart and they felt okay. You just have to be careful. But I liked it because it's, it's a nice thick, I wanted a nice thick hat kind of thing where wool tends to be a lot thinner. So yeah, that's what I got. Hey, sounds good. If you, if you want to stick around, I could uh, give you the crash course and starting from a circle again. Yes, please. Do we, do we want to go uh, back back to square one and, and uh, do that, or we'll do more show and tell first? Emma, have you been working on something there? I have been working on a pair of socks for a long time, and it would be easier if I put them in the same place more than once. Um, I thought I knew where they were. They're safe, I right? I've shown them. They're safe. But yeah, now they're in a safe place, as a lot of crafts. But because I wanted to get socks that matched, I've been working on, like, I'll do a couple of rounds on one and then a couple on the other so that I can keep them kind of matched up because I don't have one foot massively different than the other and I kind of want the same to happen with socks so <laughs> um, that makes good sense uh, I'll think, often make uh, make one sock and then if I'm building for myself just try it on as I go if I'm building for my wife then I have her try it on but often you can just match the second sock to the first one and you know follow, follow it along I want to try doing the two color spiral thing, but I'm not entirely sure how to get that started. I, I, I can't claim to have actually done one, but uh, the, the theory seems to make sense. I would be tempted to just leave, uh, leave both yarns, like get two needles and two pieces of yarn and do a, a, a double spiral, start them both at the same circle in the center and then spiral them out where you could you could run. Imagine if you got red and white, if you're feeling Eldamirian, uh, mm -hmm. you could uh, run, run your red around part way and then have the white follow behind and then just add as you go. So you're effectively two interlocking spirals. Yeah, I think um, Elinid, Elinid has, has done those before, Emily's. Nodding. <laughs> mm -hmm. Amelia, I'm just going to teach every single one of you. You know, I should be able to remember that because that's my middle name. So, Amelia. <laughs> I have, um, this is a general question, I guess. I don't know if you can answer it, Ed, but hey, your face is right off the screen. Oh, sorry. <laughs> that's okay. I'm, 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 I'm dealing with the fact here that uh, I have a large screen and then I have a laptop that has a camera. Right. Our, our home camera is currently in another room with Rylan hosting another chat. Right. Um, like this is a kind of, it's, it's not knitting because it's one needle and it's not crochet, but it seems to be like, I only ever heard about it like from in the SCA. It was never something that I ever saw in my normal world. And like there are no machines that Nile bind. They're all knitting machines. You know why, like, knitting is so much more popular than this? Is it just cultural, or is it? The, the impression I got was that nail binding used to be much more common. Like, there's there's examples of nail binding that go back to, like, Egypt. Uh, it was common in... in the 19th century, or...? Yeah, I, I, think, uh, I think it was sort of supplanted by uh, knitting a lot of places. And somebody was uh, talking about the last links to historical nail binding where somebody today who's 70 that learned from their 90 year old grandfather when they were a kid. And I think uh, some places like uh, Finland and Russia and uh, Scandinavia is where it sort of hung on longer. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's, there's a very tenuous link where this is still a, an active craft. Uh, but I think there's a lot more people that have picked it up more recently. Um, and I don't know if it's all reenactors like ourselves uh, my mom tells a story when she was uh, in Scandinavia on vacation and she was at a museum and somebody was showing off, you know, stuff. She was talking to one of the, uh, 
the curators there. And oh, she I said, know. well, this is, this is an example of knitting from the Viking age. And my mom says, so is that knitting or is that nail binding? And she got, what? You know about nail binding? Wait, here, come over here. Let me, <laughs> let me show you this other thing. <laughs> And I'm not even sure that the term is historical. I, I think it's like Danish or Swedish for like needle binding, but it, it may very well be a modern description of what it is. I think Amelia had her hand up. Did you want to ask something? No, I just wanted to um, add the point that it probably fell out of favor because it is so slow. Um, crochet is a continuous work um, of loops and knitting especially is multiple loops and is very fast. Crochet is almost as fast and then null binding is slow like embroidery because it's similar. Um, so I imagine that as you get into the industrial age, um, not many people doing it because time is money. Yep, I would, I would certainly believe that. The, the other thing you'll find, uh, today we have the advantage that you can go to the fabric store and buy big spools of yarn that are long. Um, Somebody had commented that if you go back to the, the era when we're making yarn by drop spindle spinning, um, if you wanted to weave a garment, you would need six spinners working flat out just to keep pace with one uh, weaver. Um, for nail binding, you, you're gonna have that similar case where if you're spinning your own stuff, it doesn't matter how long it is and you might not have big long lengths to work with. And uh, Nail binding, um, if you happen to have the off cuts of weaving, you might have these little chunks that are 12 or 18 inches long. You can do nail binding with that. I imagine for knitting, it would be a pain <laughs> and you would lose all that extra speed. Um, I think my preferred length for this is probably about two meters. Uh, I'll take two sizable arm lengths and then I'll double it up on the needle and then I don't have to splice quite as often. Um, but hey, whatever you well, got to work with. I found that to be useful for myself. The about about six feet. Yes, I'm in this. I'm in the states, um, uh, and I spin my own yarn too. And so uh, my stuff is really thin, so I go for the more denser uh, stitches. I tried to learn Ar Oslo, and it 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 didn't it didn't like me. Do you, do you know what stitch you prefer? Um, on, right now, I prefer the Dolby. Um, I actually, things clicked when I started trying the Momin. Okay. Oslo just didn't, didn't work at all. But the Dolby is pretty much my go-to favorite. Okay. Yeah, the Mammon stitch is just about a double Oslo. It's like, mm -hmm. under, uh, it's, it's like interlinked through two stitches or two previous stitches instead of one previous yeah. stitch. And Dolby is yeah. even just a little more than that, isn't it? It has a twist. Um, the, you take the, the, well, I do it on the thumb. You take the thumb loop and you pick up one more loop in the back and then you twist that loop in the back and then you send them through. Hmm. I, I could that see where that would be very, very useful <laughs> with the, uh, the thinner uh, gauge yes, of yarn. Exactly. Yes. All right, there seemed to be some interest in um, Sir Edward in going through the initial part Go of back, getting it back, started. Back, back to basics. Okay, so I'm going to do the, uh, the how do you start for a circle and uh, somewhere here we've got a little chunk of yarn that we just spliced together. So maybe we'll use that one. And you're back in the spotlight. And back in the spotlight. Okay, so I'm going to, yeah, we'll use this one. So here's our little tiny piece of yarn that we just spliced together. We'll start with that one. Um, so I tend to start, I'm going to tilt this down. And actually, let's do this. I'm going to put the screen where I can see it on my other monitor. I'm going to point this back down at my desktop. Okay, so I've got a piece of yarn here. I'm going to fold it over. So I've got it crisscrossed. Lay it flat so everybody can see. Nope, got to go this way. And then I'm going to take the the short end here, and I'm gonna tuck it through and make a little slip knot. And feel free to follow along here. Um, it looks lousy on camera, but. Uh, so I've got a loop here that I can open up larger, and if I do so, then it's the small end that moves. 
So I, if I was a cowboy making a lasso, I'd probably want the other end to be slippery, but, and if I pull this small end, then it gets smaller, and I'm gonna start out by making that pretty large. Okay, so now for me, I wanna orient this so I can use it consistently. So I tend to lay it out and put the long piece sticking up and the loop in the bottom. So it looks sort of like a number six. And it probably doesn't point that way on your camera because my monitor is the other way around, but we could do it that way so that the, the loop goes up to the top and the, the ring is at the bottom and my needle is gonna go on this end. And then I'm gonna actually hold onto this center by grabbing the knot of that slip knot and pinching it between my thumb and forefinger on my left hand. And then I'm gonna have the, the tail down the back and all of my first few stitches here are gonna start by putting the needle down through the center loop and then up through the top and pulling. And I'm gonna snug that up until it's about the size of the needle left over. Uh, if you were going for a denser stitch, you could make this smaller, but that's probably pretty good. So there's stitch number one. Stitch number two is gonna be down through the center, up through the first stitch that we got. So I can, uh, can remember discussing nail binding with somebody and Gus would know Master Sylard. And Sylard basically explained nail binding which by explaining, oh, it's just a bunch of half hitches. And if you're a knot person and you know what a half hitch is, then it's kind of just a bunch of half hitches, yeah. But it's how you interlock them with each other that makes it a different stitch. Okay, so stitch number one, stitch number two, number three is down through the center, up through the last one. Oop. So you're kind of going, sorry, can I ask a question or am I breaking yep. the rules? No, go for um, it. So, okay, you're going down the center, up through the loop. Where are you going in relation to your length of yarn? Like, is it kind of going through it as well. That's what I'm having trouble seeing. Okay, so let me see if I can get a little more, uh, I'll tilt this up a little bit. So the, uh, so the center loop is here. Yes. The long piece of yarn, I hold it pointed away from myself, so it's hanging off the backside. Um, so if you can imagine that this, this ring is the center of the clock and we're building up stitches sort of at eight, nine, 10 o'clock and I'm stitching from the center out towards the 12 o'clock position. And then my, my outgoing yarn is going over the stitch that I'm in the process of making. So if you were to describe this stitch, your, your outgoing yarn is, is going over the stitch you're making. Now, this is also the one that we- I think I see it, thank you. You can see it? Okay. I think so, yep. <laughs> we'll find out. Now there are different stitches that where they go in relation to each other going out is different, but this is your, this is probably your most basic one. Um, so again, I'm going to go down through the center. Wow. Getting a camera that points where you want it to is the real challenge for this. I'm sure there are people that have high, high tech overhead cameras that just look down on them. And if I could have it over my shoulder, that would make this easier. So down through the center, up through the last stitch over on the outside. And if I was looking at this, I would have to say my tension is maybe a little on the loose side, but you can, you can sort of go back and pull your stitches a little tighter if you want to snug them up. So down through the center, up to the outside. Again, I have my fingers in the way. Like so. Down through the center, up to the outside. So you can see we're starting to get a little flower-like shape here. If I lay it flat on my desk, I would consider this kind of the top with the yarn pointing out of it. The center loop here is an exaggerated size right now, so it's easy to find. And my original starting spot with a slip knot is here. And then there's a tiny little tail that we're gonna use to snug that up later. And that'll eventually be the in the end of the sock or the top of the hat. And you could weave that back through or you can just sort of ignore it and it's pretty, pretty safe. Put the needle back on here. So I would probably have the hole in the needle be just a little snugger if I often worked with just a single strand of wool. Uh, this is pretty good to get more, 
more diameter of wool through it. Okay, throw, where's my best angle here to get here? Down through the center, up through the previous stitch, and across. So if this is gonna be the top of a hat or something, then I can pack a few more stitches in here. Uh, if I wanted this to be the finger of a glove or the thumb of a mitten, I might keep the number of stitches in that first ring a little smaller because I don't want it to get too big too fast. Okay, so here I've got, oh, let's count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That's probably not a bad number. One of them in the middle here is a little smaller. So we'll see if we can spread them around. The nice thing with these all being interlocking spirals is you can you can sort of steal from one to, to make the other one a little larger if the tension's not quite right. The other thing you'll find, depending on your yarn, you may get some twist as you're going. If you're always stitching the same way, you'll tend to introduce some more twist to your, your piece. So you may find you pick it up and, and let it un, untwist if it's all, all twisty on you. So when I get to the point where I'm a good portion of the way around that circle, I'm gonna take that original sliding end and I'm gonna hold the slip knot and I'm gonna snug that up. And I'm just gonna sort of space these around until it looks much more like a circle with stitches all the way around it. Everybody see that? So there's the original slip knot. We've gone all the way around the outside and effectively the, the last stitch we put in is now touching the first stitch we made. I'll put my needle back on here. And we're gonna have enough to get just a couple of stitches on the next row and then we'll have to splice on again. So we'll make that nice and tight. So I normally turn this around. So again, the spot that I'm working is kind of at the top from my perspective. So more like there. And then my next stitch, this is sort of finishing the first row and starting the next one. So I'm gonna go down through what was originally the first stitch that we added past our slip knot. And I'm gonna go up through the most recent knot like so. So the, the piece of yarn I'm going under here is the previous row. And then I'm going under and over the one in the current row. Like so. And then since I want this to expand a little bit, I'm gonna put a second stitch through that same knot, uh, same previous row loop and up through the outside. You can see I'm just about out of yarn there. And up here. Okay, any questions about starting? Got it this time. Got it. If you, if you do this five or 10 times, it will start to make sense. So it never hurts to do a few more of those and just, just, just work through it, get, get used to it. And, uh, and, and you were saying you were starting from the, the cuff at the bottom of the uh, mitten or the rim around the forehead of the cap and going back towards the center and just reducing number of stitches. Yes, that's, that's what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And I know there so are lots of people that do that way, especially if you do a, a more complicated stitch like an Oslo stitch. I know there are people that like yeah. that. Um, yeah, I've done some of each. Uh, I learned with the start at the tip first, and that's still what I prefer, but I can see the advantage of each. Mm -hmm. Well, that's just how, um, oh, at Blue Dragon, Angie, what's her ska name? I've got, you all have two names and it's making me crazy. I can't keep them all straight. <laughs> Farrah, Farrah Odd's daughter. Yes, that's it. Thank you. So we sat and she showed me the Saturday Night at Blue Dragon and that's, we start with the line and that way you could make it big enough to go around your head and then connect the two ends, make sure everything's straight and then add your rows on until you get up to the top and start shrinking it. Yep, yep, that so, makes sense. And uh, yeah. So do you know what uh, stitch you're doing? Are you doing one of the ones that goes around your thumb as a space? Yeah, it's the one that goes around your thumb. And I think uh, one of the other ladies was talking about it. You go, you go okay. under this, under, there's two, two strings around your thumb and you go under top, under, under, give it a twist and then back down the other side of your thumb under both strings. So I think that's the Oslo stitch, but I don't actually know. So it depends. So let me see if I can get this to the camera. So if I was to put one on my, th so I've got a yep. single strand on my thumb. Yep. 
and I'm and still going go around around. clockwise. So if yep. I was to pick up one from below, yep. get one behind your thumb and through. Yep. And, and then, then around like that. And then yep. pull it tight. And then the nice thing with the thumb tension is effectively your thumb becomes the brakes on the next edge. Yes. So it was much easier oh, to oh. get the tension yep. uh, more yep. even. So that, that's absolutely Oslo stitch. So okay. the, there's another style where you put two stitches on your thumb and you do the same thing. Yeah. You get one, one behind and two on there would be like here. Yeah. I haven't done this one in a while. So that would be called mammon stitch or there's another variant. I think it's called Corgan stitch that are, okay. but it's a, it's a similar case. But if you look at where your yarn goes, it's like under, under, over, under, over, over. <laughs> Lots of using O's. <laughs> under, like, under, over. Yeah, and I can never remember. It's like Hald or Hansen are the two people that have a lot of nail binding terminology, and I can never remember which one is which. But uh, the uh, you'll see lots of U's and O's, and it's very much the if you were to imagine that your needle was going to track this through, it would go under this, under this, over that, and then either out the backside, or if it went through and then changed direction, then yeah. going the other way, it would be under under over under over over and there always tends to be an extra one on the way out because you're going over your own thread that you just put in yes yep yeah. so yeah I, I, just... I, I actually made my first oslo stitch garment without anybody ever showing me the thumb thing oh, okay and it was a lot slower than it is when you use your thumb even for for people like me that have a, a enormous thumb so like i mm -hmm. when i use the thumb method i routinely do this and then I take my thumb out and I go, and now I have to make it smaller. A little bit smaller. Yep, yeah. Exactly. So you're always going back and retensioning. Yeah. Well, I was doing some big fluffy yarn. I've got some big fluffy wool, so it um it it fills the holes nicely. Yep. So I don't have to so retension. Well. Yeah. So I don't have to retension as much for beginner stuff, I guess. And uh, lot, lot to be said. Uh, I think if I was doing more socks, I've done more of the, the socks out of a, a smaller gauge wool and the copper gate stitch. And when you're mm -hmm. walking on it, not having a lot of bumps is a feature. Yes. You should actually do a, a chunkier set of uh, like work socks or something and see how that works. But uh, certainly the number of stitches is a lot reduced. Okay, so we're at an hour and a half of our one hour class and I guess we're doing okay. So luckily I picked a slot where nobody was behind me that needed the, uh, needed the seat. Which yeah. Good. Uh, yeah. It'll so be we'll interesting have, tomorrow. Yeah. Tomorrow will be, will be exciting. <laughs> our, our excitement today was we went to go host our, our uh, meetings and we discovered that although the Canton Upper Natunag bought five seats for our account. Yep can't actually have the same email address host five <laughs> classes at once um, so we may be scrambling to send it a bunch more invites oh with different addresses hosting them but uh but hey it's uh, it's been a learning experience our, our <laughs> idea nice. that we could have fruits of our labors even though we can't get together is pretty good yeah for sure so if anybody has any other questions now i will happily field them and if not i may let people go and uh we'll uh We'll do some more of this another time. Uh, Edward, is, is there going to be a, a handout or a resource page or anything like that? Uh, if people have questions, I could certainly send you some links. I haven't uh, generated anything formal for handouts. I've, uh, I've always been a learn by doing guy and uh, most of my nail binding has been sit down with somebody face to face and uh, do it that way. Should put this back on the end of the screen. So. Laura says, thank you, Sir Edward. It was great. I have two thumbs and I'm trying to work with acrylic, but I almost succeeded. <laughs> well, that's good. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm happy that you're learning. And if you have any more questions, I'm intending to be on the uh, Fruits of Our Labor social space tomorrow morning. I think like 10 till noonish, and I'll no binding won't be very far away. So if you if you want to log back on, I'll see what I can do to help other questions. And uh, otherwise, everybody have a good evening. We'll, Thank you very uh, much. Thank you for welcome. joining everyone. Thank Th you. Thanks also to uh, Skaya for uh, being our moderator today. Oh, for sure. Uh, Rallyn commented that uh, her advice had been that we very much have a moderator that is not the teacher and having uh -huh. somebody who's watching for questions and, and pointing them out uh, has been a godsend. So thank you, Skaya.
Happy to help. Yay. I had natural Everything. light at the beginning of this class, and now it's all artificial light. <laughs> yeah, it's not nearly as bright outside as it was, but uh, it means we've got a lot of uh, material covered. There you go. Thank you so much. Well, well thank you all, and have good a good job. evening.